So as you've told us, the 50s are this time of, in a way, tension historically. There is a popular image of prosperity, of ideological cohesion, of conformity. Uh, these are certainly uh, patriarchal and heteronormative uh, ideologies. And at the same time, there are these tensions. There are these sort of uh, movements beginning to bubble up just beneath the surface of that seeming conformity. And women are playing a major role in the civil rights movement, in the uh, peace movement. And of course, by the end of these, uh, this decade, uh, in the election of 1960, some of these issues begin to come to the fore uh, as Kennedy and Nixon race for the presidency. What role do women play in this election? Well, this is an interesting question because in some ways their role is the same as it's always been behind the scenes. But in other ways, it's far more present. And it's present in the kinds of issues that Kennedy raises. So the one that I like to focus on, because it's the one that has the greatest consequences in some ways, is women's role in the labor movement. Here we have Esther Peterson, who's been active in the labor movement for some time, along with the women who are uh, her network of friends, who go out of their way to persuade the labor movement to support Kennedy's candidacy. And uh, of course, if we remember that at that point, the labor movement has organized about the third, 35% of the workers. So the labor movement is not the small constituency that it is today. It's a significant step to bring those labor movements into supporting Kennedy. And Kennedy not only recognizes this, but wants to reward Esther Peterson after this happens. And I, I would never argue that she is the only supportive person but the fact that she recognizes, as indeed do some of the civil rights leaders, uh, some of the women leaders of the civil rights movement, who uh, begin to argue that uh, despite the fact that Eisenhower pulled out the troops at Little Rock and so on, uh, it's time for uh, action uh, to spread democracy and it's the women who lead the charge for that spread pushing uh, Kennedy, asking for Kennedy's support for more democratic participation, voter rights, uh, activism and so on and promising their support if he will promise to give them that support and he does and they do. So women are present behind the scenes and yet their uh, requests and their demands are heard. And it's an important thing to remember, certainly for me as a labor historian, for all of us, when we think of the mid-century labor movement, it's so often thought of as white, male, industrial, and yet here's Esther Peterson leading this important coordinating effort. Yes. Well, the labor movement still is predominantly white and male, but it's not as white as male and male as it used to be, uh, largely because the CIO had uh, organized large numbers of African-American, Latino, um, uh, and women workers because they were organizing across industrial enterprises in the 1930s. By the 1950s, the so-called trades, that is the skilled trades, are still rather conservative, white and male. But when the AFL and CIO combine in 1955, remember they split in 1935, that brings into the Federation of Labor, the combined Federation of Labor, large numbers of non-white, non-male, people and it's their influence. Kennedy's after all was the first election since Eisenhower was re-elected of when the two organizations were combined and so this is his chance to both be supported by and to be supportive of the issues that they are raising. And so what does Kennedy do when he comes into office? How does he address these issues? Well, we know some of what he does for civil rights and appointing Bobby Kennedy as his um, 
uh, attorney general and so on. So leaving that aside for the moment and the voter rights thing, uh, putting that aside for the moment, what he does for women is enormously significant, uh, so significant that I don't think he recognized what he was doing. He turns to Esther Peterson, who had been uh, so useful, if you like, and uh, asks her what she'd like, what kind of office she'd like. And she thinks for not more than a moment and then asks to be director of the Women's Bureau of the Department of Labor. He's willing to make her an assistant secretary of labor, but she wants the directorship of the Women's Bureau of the Department of Labor. And that's the first thing she asks for. And the second thing she asks for is uh, that he create a commission on the status of women to explore the relationship of women to wage work. And uh, he does. In 1961, shortly after he becomes president, the Presidential Commission on the Status of Women takes shape. It's chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt uh, to give it the kind of imprimatur that it needs. And uh, its executive director is Esther Peterson. Esther Peterson immediately asks Pauli Murray, uh, who you'll remember is a, um, a civil rights activist, African-American woman, lawyer, uh, very well versed in issues of employment, but also issues of the family, and of course in the civil rights issues. And together, uh, Esther Peterson and uh, uh, Pauli Murray uh, create, and it's really Esther Peterson's recommendations, but create a commission on the status of women. Now, one of the interesting things, there are many interesting things about the Commission on the Status of Women, but the m most interesting thing from my perspective is the following. Up until the 1950s, both the Democratic and Republican parties had in some sort of abstract way supported equal rights, and equal rights amendment was often in the platform of the Republican Party and so on. But the Women's Bureau, uh, women activists, trade unionists, have since the 1920s opposed the Equal Rights Amendment on the grounds that it is what they call a blanket amendment, which would vitiate, eliminate all that protective labor legislation for women only that they had worked so hard to get. Esther Peterson creates a commission which includes uh, senators, congresspeople, uh, men and women, but uh, a relatively small group of people, yet only one of them is a pro-equal rights amendment person, Margaret Raywalt. The others are not. And the result, of course, is that although the commission itself, it's preordained that it isn't going to advocate an equal rights amendment. It does mean that it's charged with the question of how do you move towards equality for women without an equal rights amendment? And the answer to this question is Pauli Murray's genius, as far as I can see. Uh, Murray argues that the answer lies in the 14th Amendment. Let's just get the courts to ensure that equal rights, equal process under the law includes sex as well as uh, race. And that becomes the framework within which the commission operates. And the rest, as you might say, is history. This is fascinating. And for the purposes of our course, it's an interesting moment. Of course, we've shown how women have always worked. But here in 1960-61, we're seeing at the highest level of government a presidential commission that recognizes women as workers and studies them as workers. 
It, do, it does that, and yet uh, we have to be a little careful here because it also, in its final report, makes the argument, and I'm sure this was the sort of prevailing assumption of both the commission members and then the subcommittees that were created by it, it does argue that the home is still women's primary responsibility and that uh, women uh, must and can be expected to engage in the wage labor force but without undermining their home roles. So on the one hand it raises questions for the first time about how those home roles are to be preserved if women go into the labor force which is a kind of inversion of the opposite assumption, which is, was that women shouldn't go into the labor force if they had home roles to do. But on the other hand, it then looks at the labor force or at working conditions for women and asks the question of what might be done to make it possible for women to combine these two roles. And it's the putting of that question on the table, which of course opens up the larger questions. It seems in a way this captures some of the tensions we talked about in this section, that this document is absolutely considering women as workers, and yet, as you say, it's not quite breaking out of that patriarchal, home-based model that has been prevalent in uh, 50s ideology. Well, that's exactly right. In a way, you could think of it as a kind of effort to reconcile the, the tensions. It definitely does not break out of the patriarchal ideology. That is, uh, it insists that uh, women, and it's primarily women, that is, it doesn't begin yet. We don't have any conversation yet about assigning this role to men or about expanding men's roles within the family. But we do have conversations about how can we make it easier for women to uh, raise their families and engage in wage work. So the conversations are about things like, well, women will have to take out four, five, ten years from the family, uh, from the wage labor force. But let's figure out how to make it easier for them to transition back into the wage labor force. Are there uh, workshops or seminars or would we throw a little money at training to bring women's skills back up to par? Will this do the trick? Or what about child nurseries? Now this is a no-no in the 50s. Children had to have their mothers at home. And that question is not resolved, but it's on the table uh, at least. And so uh, questions like whether uh, the UAW, for example, uh, might uh, consider doing what it had done during the war, which is to think about ways of housing the children of working women. They're considered. They're not, they're not part of the solution. And indeed, one of the interesting things about this is how, um, in some ways, conservative the recommendations are, while making the assumption that we we can provide women with, for example, night school training. Uh, men can take care of the babies while the women beef up their skills so that they can become teachers and go in the workforce. The qu question is never raised about whether that responsibility of childcare can or ought to be mitigated. But questions of race are raised, uh, questions of equal pay are raised, and in fact one of the things that comes out of the Commission indirectly is the Equal Pay Act of 1963, which is the federal government's effort to um, uh, you know, bring women up to par. It doesn't succeed as we know, but there it is on the table. Uh, there's a conversation about discrimination and what's the meaning of discrimination against women, employers' preferences. Do they count as discrimination or is this just part of the culture of how things go? And it's this conversation 
which uh, ultimately results in the addition of sex to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and to the creation of the state commissions on the status of women, which follow the uh, end of the presidential commission. And of course, we know that those state commissions ultimately uh, respond to the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission and foster the creation of now the National Organization for Women. So in a way, you know, we ask the question, do, did Kennedy know what he was doing? I think Esther Peterson knew what she was doing, and I think Pauli Murray knew what she was doing. But I don't think Kennedy did. I don't think Secretary of Labor Arthur Goldberger or Schwellenbach, who uh, preceded him, I, I don't think they knew what the consequences of this presidential commission would be.